Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lisa Lenz, and I'm the Undergraduate Academic Affairs Director in the College of Information Sciences and Technology. And I have had the pleasure today of introducing you to the COIL Fisher Speaker Series presenter, Dr. Brian Smith. In the early 90s, Brian and I went to graduate school. Five years later, he still couldn't. I'm just kidding. This is parallel in his bio where he went to art school and couldn't do art. Uh, Brian did learn to do things in graduate school, and seriously, we met there at Northwestern University in the 90s, and a few years later, we both found ourselves back at Penn State, uh, where we reconnected at the Solutions Institute with some of you who are in the room today. Um, if you have not met Brian before, you're in for a treat. If you have met him before, then you know he has some fun with names. And my slides aren't able to be shown today, but there were some pretty cool slides playing on his name. Um, so I'll just cut to the chase and say we're going to talk about B. Smith, like to be Smith. Uh, Brian has been passionate about designing for learning. He has focused his career on design and learning, design in classroom settings, using computer-supported scientific inquiry in biology, design in informal out-of-class settings, using mobile technologies to enhance reflection, even design in design settings, using body storming to design better mobile learning experiences, and design in patient settings, using state-of-the-art digital cameras to help diabetic youth learn about healthier food choices. And pertinent to today's discussion, design in STEM settings, considering the addition of art to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. Brian is an out-of-the-box creative researcher an inventive designer, and a thought leader at the intersection of education, technology, and innovation. As it states in his bio for today, he's been a faculty member at MIT, at Penn State, and now at Drexel University. He has served as dean of the Rhode Island School of Design's Continuing Education Unit, which I think you'll hear a lot about today. And he's a founding member of SEED Network for Sciences, Engineering, Art, and Design. I'm wondering where math went, but... Um, so today, uh, Brian is going to talk about building innovation and identity with STEAM. And would you please help me give him a warm welcome to Dr. Brian Smith. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. What a great introduction. Uh, let me just, I may as well just move into what we're going to talk about today. So I, I, as Lisa mentioned, I've been doing a lot of work in the last couple of years around um, this particular word, STEAM. Um, and so when I, when I say STEAM in this particular context, um, it's important, a lot of different meanings of STEAM, so don't get confused by this kind of STEAM, number one. Uh, for those of you who are gamers, BART, um, it is not this STEAM, this is uh, the Valve Corporation um, game, uh, it's the online gaming system so that you can download games. Uh, and if you, if you actually type STEAM into Google or a search engine, this will be the first one that you get. Um, but this is actually, of course, not what we're talking about, Lisa alluded to it, uh, that we break the word down to STEAM is actually really an acronym, and it's an acronym that's sort of come into play uh, in the last five years or so. Uh, that is STEM plus art, that's the A. Uh, and at the, my last institution, we always stuck design in there too, um, because it was important for us to think about sort of the hybrid between what the arts uh, and what the sort of more applied design um, disciplines also can bring to this. So uh, again, if you think about this uh, in terms of STEM, plus art and design, the first thing you really have to do is to really kind of think about, well, what do we mean by STEM? Uh, so I think everyone in the room is probably familiar with this sort of configuration of word STEM, uh, scientific, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, there's certainly been a lot of media attention about this, and, and, and every time you turn around, someone is talking about issues in STEM education and how do we improve STEM education. Um, so uh, again, a lot of my work has been focused in thinking about education reform around the scientific and uh, technology, engineering, mathematics disciplines. Um, I believe that actually the first time I saw these four words together, um, sort of lumped in this way, was really from the National Science Foundation. Um, probably late 90s, I'm looking at an NSF guy, late 90s, early 2000s. In a sense to say, these are number one, the disciplines that we care about at the National Science Foundation. These are the things that we value. Um, and that we sort of place um, uh, research time and effort into. And also uh, emphasizing, because the NSF has a very strong education presence, that these are the disciplines that we're, uh, that we're sort of charged with trying to think about how to change and how to improve. So again, you can kind of think about it as, um, first off, as a charge, in fact, from, say, the National Science Foundation for researchers to really think about how can we improve educational practice. 
And as I recall, the, the first incarnation of this, they called it science, mathematics, engineering, technology. So it was actually SMET before it was STEM. And so we want kids to get really into SMET. Okay, this is a little too close to SMUT. Kind of sounds like something that you step in. Got some SMET on my... So that gives way to, um, to STEM that is the way that we talk about it today. And, and I, I mentioned this sort of because it's interesting. You can twist games with the, these letters um, in different ways, much as we've done by talking about STEAM. Um, is to say, well, in fact, if we take that, if we go SMET to STEM, we can then think about STEAM. And really, um, what I'll talk about for the most part, for most of my talk is really like why art and design is important uh, to try and think about with STEM. Um, one can think of other disciplines also being added to this. And in fact, when we started really sort of pushing STEAM out into the world, uh, I don't know how to say it. It's a lot of people said, well, my discipline equally could sort of help uh, think about uh, how to improve STEM education. So for instance, we heard people say, we were going to make STEAM, but our A is astronomy. Because kids should know about the stars and the planets. And even though it's a science, it has an important role. Um, and then people said, well, you can also have architecture, because that's my particular domain. And I think it's a very important thing for people to learn about that. Uh, there was STEAM with another M on the end for medicine. There was STEAM, where you put an H for the humanities. Uh, and people really started to kind of add a lot of different things. You, I, I remember meeting with someone shortly after getting a Drexel who said, I, well, she actually said it this way, you're a STEAM guy, as if one can be such a thing. And when I say A, I mean agriculture, not art and design. And I said, well, that's A equals arbitrary. And that, she doesn't return my calls anyway. <laughs> that way. I don't really know what that's about. But it, it certainly is the case that for a long time, a lot of people were trying to sort of understand the problem is, is thinking about how do we improve STEM education by putting other disciplines in it. And really, I think the STEAM movement, although by embracing art and design, in some cases, actually isn't very much different than a lot of the science reform uh, and the projects that come out of various innovative research groups that are really trying to sort of understand how to get students more involved in doing hands-on science and really thinking about the nature of inquiry uh, experimentation. So the arts and designs really sort of tries to strengthen that point. It's not trying to add additional stuff to the STEM agenda. Um, to be fair, the uh, mother of the acronym STEAM, in many cases, is a woman uh, named George, Georgette Yakman, um, who was doing work. Uh, she had written a master's thesis that started to touch upon these ideas, um, I believe around 2006, and then sort of coined the acronym um, and now runs the company steamedu.com that's trying to do good work in terms of pushing um, materials and helping teachers and others who really wanted sort of an active step in their classroom. Um, and so the way that she formulated it was to say it's, it's seeing the science and technology interpreted through engineering and the arts, all based in mathematical elements, which is a little bit private to say, uh, to sort of grasp hold of. But my interpretation of that um, and these various papers that she's written is that it's, if you can take the, these disciplines, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and start to look at them not as individual silos, but in fact as integrated in some ways, that science supports engineering, and that mathematics supports all of these disciplines and technology enables a lot of the work that goes on in them. Um, and then you combine those, now it's sort of integrated silos, alongside the arts. And for her, the arts was fine arts, uh, visual arts, performing arts, uh, liberal arts, language arts, so uh, the, those things that we might call the humanities. Um, and sort of to take kind of um, a sort of a, a, a very integrated approach to thinking about how you would do these educational um, uh, interact. Uh, designed interventions um, using thinking about science and then approaching that from the realm of, let's say, writing or music. Um, so I'll say that uh, it's the mother of the STEAM acronym. Um, there's another person I like to sort of think about when I think of STEAM, uh, and that is Seymour Papert, who never said the word STEAM during his, his career, um, but the sort of sensibilities that, the, that he brought to educational technology is very much uh, very STEAM, uh, very STEAMy, that's a good way to put it. Um, so Seymour, for those of you who know, um, was at MIT. I had the great pleasure of working with Seymour for a number of years while I was there. Um, he was the, the inventor of the logo programming language. That was the first programming language for kids, uh, designed for children. And uh, if you remember it or never saw it, the, the whole sort of metaphor was there's a turtle on the screen, 
And what you would do with the turtle is you would give it commands to, uh, you basically program the turtle to say, go forward 20 steps, turn right uh, 90 degrees, go forward another 20 steps. And, and this would ultimately give you a, a range of geometric patterns. And it was really about sort of having kids initially uh, think about math through having this turtle move around the screen. Um, this, this thing here uh, is actually a turtle. See, at one point in the 60s, we didn't have those fancy screens. So this was the, one of the original turtles. It was actually a robot, and then it drew on real paper. And uh, that was sort of, you know, and then it was, uh, obviously, it was, became like, oh, would it be cool to just have that on a screen? Now we're going back to, wouldn't it be cool to have that embodied physically? So it all comes around. Um, besides developing that program language, Seymour is well known for a theory called constructionism. And it's a learning theory that builds on constructivism. The important thing here is that Seymour and the constructivist, uh, the constructionist uh, uh, sort of that, that theory essentially says that it's about having children learn best when actively engaged in construction and the construction of something that's personally meaningful. And there was another piece that's not reflected up here, and that was that those personally meaningful constructions would be shared with others. And um, there's something very powerful about uh, thinking about sort of that kind of statement in terms of what happens in an art or a design studio where, in fact, if you go to art school, everything you do is construct things that are personally meaningful, sometimes, unfortunately, personally meaningful, because there's these things called critiques, where you can lay it all out there and say, this is this wonderful piece I've made, and then the critiques that come back are not necessarily all that polite. So you, you get a thick skin uh, by being in those art studios. Um, but again, it's a very similar idea, that we will make something that's per perfectly, uh, personally meaningful and then shared within some group. So that's the godfather, Seymour. Um, another sort of last thing to sort of set up the kind of theme idea is um, in 2011, we had a workshop at Rhode Island School of Design that was uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. It's called Bridging STEM to STEAM. And uh, we had a number of educators there. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, educators, artists, scientists, advertising people. Uh, just a, a wide range of, of people trying to sort of think about what does this mean. And Margaret Honey, who is the president of the New York Hall of Science, uh, where they do uh, it's a fantastic science museum and also the host, uh, they co-host the New York Maker Fair. Um, and the maker movement is undoubtedly a very big part of the STEAM movement sort of pushing forward. Uh, and so Margaret said um, uh, in, in one of our discussions, it was that this isn't really about, this has nothing to do with saying taking STEM and adding arts to it. This is really about trying to sort of get at uh, changing education to really incorporate experimentation and exploration. So again, this idea that it's, um, it's somewhere in the STEM, the STEM classrooms, STEM lecture halls, that these ideas of experimentation and exploration, which are certainly part of the scientific disciplines, somehow gets lost in a lot of our educational context. Um, and so the STEAM sort of movement for her was, how do we bring those things back and make sure they're front and center and also, I would add to that an engagement. Because again, if you think about an art studio where people are creating things that are personally meaningful, they're if, uh, in any painting class, people are experimenting, they're exploring, they're working with their, medium, with their mediums, and there's a real sense of engagement with, uh, with the work and, and a passion about being in a particular environment. Um, so those are kind of some setup. And I want to just give two quick examples of things that one might consider steamy. Um, the first is um, at Drexel University, I work with a center called the Excite Center. And that's Expressive and Creative Interaction Technologies. It's a center that's been around for about a year, uh, a little over a year now, uh, and run by a guy named uh, Young Moo Kim, who's an electrical engineer uh, and also sings opera and works in acapella groups. And so he's a vocalist. His work is really around machine listening, so he does a very deep understanding of um, machine learning, um, signal processing, um, and, and he likes to say that he was a, he started his PhD at the MIT Media Lab when I started as an assistant professor, and that way people can go, oh, Brian, you're so much older, and he really enjoys that. Um, but the Excite Center, every year, Young Move runs a summer music technology camp. And so in this camp, let's see if we can, this, this much I know I can do. We'll see if there's sound that comes out. And it doesn't even matter that there's no sound. But, um, so what happens in the summer music technology camp is that Young Moo is using the idea of music and expression. 
and it's sort of banking on the fact that lots of kids are into music, right? And so he brings up these scientific principles like uh, to talk about acoustic resonance, if you simply talk about that in some kind of abstract lab, you might not get kids' attention. But if you actually say to them, we're going to work with musical interfaces and think about you know, computer, different, different kinds of computer programming, and we're going to use that through thinking about music. Or if you give them the opportunity to say, you can create your own musical instrument, and then we'll 3D print that instrument. Um, this would be the part where, where sound would be good, but it's, uh, it's, it's musical. Yeah, I'll describe it for you. <laughs> They're musical. Um, so creating circuits. Again, thinking of, if you think about those familiar with the maker movement, this idea of now putting uh, electronics and programming, different, things, uh, different sorts of um, computational tools into people's hands, and then driving that through, uh, these are with, probably with Makey Makeys. Uh, so again, the, the, using standard kinds of stuff that's now off the shelf. Makey Makeys, Arduinos, and those kinds of electronic kits um, to engage students in thinking about, well, how can we sort of think about engineering and all these other concepts um, through uh, musical, uh, basically sort of by making and generating musical objects. Um, so like I said, there's not really, um, it's a great program. We do this every summer. Um, there are many, many examples of programs like this. Uh, I show this one because it is at my home institution at this point. Um, and I think that what's really happening in a lot of cases where people are looking at things like how do you do, how do you take STEM concepts and teach them through music or fashion or drawing or animation is, is really some, is a sort of a recognition that, that young people uh, are very expressive. I mean, that's sort of the bottom line. And a lot of that expression is very divorced from what they might do in school settings. So trying to build these environments where, in fact, kids are engaged in their learning, and also being able to say that we can do substantive science, technology, engineering, and math. And, I, and by that, I mean there are some people who would say, well, STEAM, what that means is you take uh, a science lesson. Let's do some biology. We'll do uh, a biology lesson where we'll learn the parts of, the of a jellyfish. We'll memorize those. And then we're going to put some A in that. We're going to let kids draw the jellyfish at the end. Right, the draw jellyfish problem, as we call it. And that's not, a, not at all what we mean when we're talking about STEAM. Um, I think the kinds of things that we're looking at when we do talk about STEAM are actually very similar to, to the kinds of, if those of you who are familiar with next generation science standards, a lot of what we did initially in trying to think about how to talk about the frame STEAM is to really look at, number one, where were those science standards going? And in particular, how they connected science to engineering design. So in the next generation science standards, there is a, a piece that says you know, it's very important to actually have kids sort of think about the world through a scientific lens and a lens that's more sort of engineering, a more design kind of sensibility. And some of our framing and thinking about this initially was, so what would the arts and design, an artistic, more aesthetic design, bring to that and then complement so that you would actually have sort of three layers that students might be able to sort of look at, a particular thing like observation, let's say. Um, and be able to look at that in different ways and sort of gain greater depth. Um, do I want to do the second example? Things that sort of kind of, it's so risky. I'm feeling like the risk here. So I think the thing I was going to do, I was going to do, yep, I'm going to do it. Why not? I'm going to have, have Stubbs come up and ride on a bike. Um, to show, so you know how it is, um, I'm an academic. And so when people came to me initially and said, we have this great idea called STEAM. We're going to integrate art and design. I did, you know, what academics did. I said, yeah, I already thought of that. I did that. That's, because that's how we roll. <laughs> I did that. And so in particular, this is the way that I, I thought about it. And I said, let me give you an example. And this example is not nearly as explicit. Uh, it's not as sort of, here is music, and we will work through this. But I, I, I thought it maybe it'd be fun to sort of pull back for some of you who, who might maybe even seen this. Let's see if this works. Um, and when I say go back, I mean go back, <laughs> back going back a little bit. Let's see here. Oh, that's not uh, my resolution's not so good, so you can't see the full thing. But and and don't call me a fanboy. Okay, I'm not an Apple fanboy. I can't even see the. Uh oh. See, this is the problem. Now by not being able to see the. Okay. This this was going to be a lot simpler. Let's try it. It's going to be hard. So this is, um, this is going way back. This is a program called The Animal Landlord that I wrote as part of my dissertation. And I run it mostly because I can. 
<laughs> uh, so it's really old software. For some of you look young and you're going like, I don't even know what that was, whatever that thing was, this, this antique. The idea in this was that we, we deployed this in high school biology classroom. And it was we took nature films. So they, the topic was really behavioral ecology. And we were building software as part of a, a larger piece of software tools called Beguile. And this was all um, run by Brian Reiser at Northwestern University. And so this particular piece of the Beguile modules was to have kids sort of think about how do lions behave when they're chasing and trying to eat stuff. There, that's the simple way. Uh, and we used nature films as the way to drive this. So it was uh, a series of different films that all were selected to sort of illustrate the range of predation behaviors that a lion and its prey might have. And we specifically took all the narration off of these films. So there was no voiceover. And, and part of what we said was the kids would have to do what I just did. You would actually grab a frame of film and say, this is it's an important moment in this film. And now we're going to sort of talk about it in terms of observation and interpretation. So fundamental scientific kinds of things that you need to do when you're doing uh, certainly biological inquiry. Um, what do I observe and what are the interpretations I can make from that? So there was a little bit of um, help in this sort of script window to get them to think about that. Uh, there were some other tools that's going to make it hard because of my resolution, but I'm going to let's see what we can do. Um, just to show you some example of some of the stuff that came out of that. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Uh, who knows? How about you? What did you do? I hope you're a good one. So this is a um, <laughs> random. Uh, so this is an example of sort of the first cut of students trying to do this kind of annotation, right? So they would say, oh, well, the predator, you know, what do we observe as the predator detects the prey? It senses the prey, then watch. Predator is waiting for a good time to hunt the prey. So they would start this way and try to, to uh, essentially build these uh, narratives around what was happening. Uh, there were different ways also that uh, groups of students could look at multiple films after they had, had sort of annotated them. Um, actually, I guess you can say, you can almost, we can say tagging now. We didn't say tag back then. That meant something that you did with a spray can back in, the, in these days. Um, so they would sort of annotate or tag these films with things. This tool would allow them to say, show me all of the films, the moment in the films where they stock, right? And the things would fade out if there was no stocking. So, the kind of discourse that was happening in the classroom was students saying, groups of students saying, okay, so we have these two movies and the lion is stalking at these particular points. What is similar and different? So it's about thinking about variation. Again, another fundamental thing that you have to think about when, when doing um, any kind of ecology evolution. What are the sort of um, selective pressures that might lead to certain kinds of behaviors or the animal not being able to catch its prey or being able to catch its prey? So there was a lot of sort of discussion around these films and why, why do these things look, why don't you have stalking in these two films? Why wasn't it necessary for the lion to stalk at that point? Um, there were some other things where we would hang, uh, they would make trees that sort of resemble, that sort of model what are all of the different possible outcomes, uh, the paths to outcomes. And so how does it look if you start to try to make general models of the behavior after looking at a, a, a lot of films like this? Um, and I would show you video to show you some of the engagement that happened in the classroom. But, um, you know, it's easier to, as it turns out, it's much easier to don't, don't, don't. It's much easier to run 20-year-old software than it is to find like one of those super eight height players to get the cassette in the video. So that, that was going to take a little bit more time. But the reason I show that is to say that although we weren't thinking about that as STEAM at the time, the, the sort of core idea of getting students to ask questions about looking at, you know, in this case, video data, um, pulling away the narration. It was, a it was sort of a big deal for us to then say, what we're doing is using this nature film medium, something that kids know and adults know, and are used to hearing narrators talk in a particular way that's usually for entertainment purposes. And trying to sort of get the language of that to be much more towards, how do I generate causal explanations of behavior? Um, and so the sort of film backdrop was important because it set the stage. Um, it built the expectations of here's sort of what people do now. This is what Jacques Rousteau says, and now we think you can do better in terms of becoming more scientific. Okay, let me see how I'm going to get this to. We'll see if this works again. 
So that, um, that was a good work that I referred to um, when people first said, yeah, we have this new idea steam, and I gave them the, yeah, I already did that. In fact, I did a, a number of projects around sort of video um, photography. Some of those projects with photography with uh, the good Dr. Susan Land, who's sitting in front of the room live tweeting. And, um, so, and so a number of those kinds of things around some imagery as well. And using the fact that the photograph can capture lots of different, uh, uh, not only can it capture a lot of, of, of behaviors or things that happen in the world that you might want kids to do to think about scientifically, uh, but also taking advantage of the fact that taking pictures is a very expressive thing. Uh, and that certainly now with the, now that the, the dawn of the smartphone with cameras and them being ubiquitous, you see many more, it's, I put my stuff on Pinterest, Instagram, other places that, you know, they probably shouldn't put them. Uh, and so that's, again, another sort of way that we've played with this idea over the years uh, in terms of, of thinking about what is it interesting about this expressive capability of the image uh, and how does that move into science. So um, I left Penn State in 2009 at December 2009 and started at Rhode Island School of Design. And uh, Rhode Island School of Design, or RISD, is, is generally known as one of the top art and design schools, certainly top independent art and design schools in the country, if not the world. And if I, if I still work there, I would say the number one art and design college in the world. But I don't. This is not film, so I don't. <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, but it's a great art school. The students are amazingly creative. Um, and one of the first questions actually I asked when I got there is I went to the facilities guys and I said, so how do you know when it's art? And they said, what do you mean? And I said, obviously there must be things that just appear at an art and design school. Like um, people just, you know, galleries or exhibits just showing up and they said, oh, that's easy. If it, uh, if it violates fire code, it ain't art. And if there's a live animal in it, it ain't art. And otherwise, pretty much everything up was, in, it was you know, up for grabs. <clears throat> and you can read about that in my book. Um, so there was a lot of things, uh, great things that I saw there. Uh, and I was at RISD, actually, as, the, um, as Lisa mentioned, I was in RISD Continuing Education, or RISD CE, we called it. So we were the Continuing Education Unit. Uh, I was the dean of the uh, Rhode Island School of Design Continuing Ed Unit. This is, how, this is what happens when you resign. This is what they, how they give you tribute. Um, before I took the position of dean, which I never thought I would do, I, I did remember sending a message in 2008 to my, to my wonderful introducer, where I, I did, for some strange reason, say, please remind me, never should do that. And um, I'm sorry I didn't listen, because you did, you did want me. Um, one of my favorite art pieces that I made at Rizzi, I have to show you this, because I was the, was the dean, was every once in a while I would get email, not every once in a while, Every other minute, I would get emails with these strange, strange requests. Again, at a school where a lot of things were, uh, were basically, if it didn't involve a live animal or fire, or fire code, anything goes. So a lot of the requests were pretty out there. So this was my little piece of performance. I had, uh, this was my dean's toolkit. You'll see at the top, email would come in. I would simply sort of tap the top. No. This is how I would respond. No, that ain't my problem. That ain't my fault. I ain't got no money. And it was actually pretty good. You could just pick one at random and just send mail to people. And that <laughs> seemingly worked out for at least three years, eight months, and a couple of weeks. Um, now I get to brag on my continuing education unit that I ran while I was there. And that is, um, I'm touching the wrong, but too many screens here. So this is continuing education. Uh, we had, um, at my time, around 4,500 students a year. I hope that they have more because that's always what you're trying to do is to sort of increase enrollment. Um, 4,500 students a year, and, and as you can imagine, as a continuing education unit, one of the things we had was a lot of adults coming. Um, you know, they were working adults and they were coming in night classes. We ran night school, we ran Saturday programs, and also large programs in the summer. So you had a big adult population. Uh, we had a very uh, large children's, uh, we called it the Young Artist Programs, uh, that were also running. And then we had a lot of teenage programs. And so these were the kinds of three bands that we thought of when we thought of our audience was adults, teens, young artists. Um, almost sort of bimodal in terms of sort of the children and the teens and then the adults in terms of sort of the distributions of, of people that were, were coming to the courses. Um, and, and our tagline, the official tagline was, um, we make art and design for everyone. 
And, and I think that the, um, part of the appeal of this position for me was the idea of actually sort of trying to establish and, and oversee an, uh, a unit that was dedicated to saying, we are going to bring people in the door and we don't care who you are, what age you are. If you want to pursue some kind of visual arts, uh, to get yourself immersed in visual creativity, we have some kind of offering here. Um, and so, I mean, I used to also say, as the dean, I used to say, like, we, we are here to provide art and design for, for people ages 5 to 85. And so it was very much a, a part of our sort of value system that we, wanted, we thought about access. We thought about how do we make sure that these courses are available for everyone. And really this idea of youth to senior was a big part of, of the draw for me to go there. Speaking of draw, uh, I'd never learned how to draw. I did say that at the beginning. This is a lion, in case you didn't know it, because I did the lion. Anyway, my daughter, just, she's kind of embarrassed by this whole thing. She's got pretty good visual chops. But, um, one of the reasons that I did, I think the primary reason that I went to Rhode Island School of Design's Continuing Education Unit, and it's a question that people have asked, um, is really this idea, again, of making arts accessible. And I'm going to put up this figure. Um, this is a, is a graphic that, was, that, that many of you have seen uh, that was generated at the at University of Washington's Life Center. It was an NSF-funded center that looked at learning in and outside of schools. And, and the graph is it's, it's sort of always interesting to come back and think about it. The, the general idea here is that this centerpiece is essentially a representation of time spent in school. So you can see the, the uh, grades one, and, 1 through 12 down here. You can, you know, some people will then move on from that to go do undergraduate studies. And then some people will pursue grad studies. And all throughout life and work, there are times for formal educational opportunities, things that they feel like school. And then there's this sort of sea of opportunity around it, where in fact people learn, because we don't just learn at school, um, where people are learning in very sort of informal ways. And those might take place in science centers. Uh, it might be through science television. Uh, it might be through YouTube, video games. Um, all of these things, especially now with, uh, with more and more emerging technologies, the sort of possibilities of thinking and learning in informal spaces are, have just continued to grow. And a continuing education unit actually sort of falls into this space, this sea of opportunity. Although we had very designed classes, we were, um, one of the things that people talk about in the informal education community is free choice learning. And so we were very much free choice. Our 4,500 students essentially came to us because they really wanted to learn something about art and design. And um, for me, I guess as a researcher, I thought, well, that's a really appealing thing. To number one, have the three bands of audience where I can look at creativity across a lifetime. And we actually had instances where we knew of people who came to the Young Artist Program at six or seven, took a couple classes, then took some teen classes, uh, went to our residential six-week, um, very intense summer program in pre-college, became RISD students graduated with a BFA, uh, and then would come back as adults and take courses in Photoshop or Illustrator or other things to sort of hone their craft. So we actually had examples of people that we could start to look at and go like, we can really start to think, sort of think about this over a lifetime, how people are sort of thinking about and the development of creativity. This was my idea before I, I, I understood that I was going to be sending mail that said, no, that ain't my problem most of the time. Um, the second thing that at some point, we sort of started to think about it, Rizvi, was looking at this particular graphic and, and sort of seeing it in a different way. And that way is if you look at the sort of center school pieces of this, there's a lot of science and math, and I won't say technology and engineering in this case, uh, but certainly a lot of science and math that takes place in the school setting. It's very rare to see people, I mean, it's much rarer to see in sort of the informal spaces people getting really jazzed about math. I'm not sure that they're jazzed about the math in the school settings either, but there's a lot of science in the center, and it felt like there was a lot less in the informal settings, especially when you compared it to the amount of, of, of time that kids, for instance, will spend doing expression with some kind of artistic medium. Right? So it's on, the, on Saturdays, like I was saying earlier, my daughter's going to dance class. She takes dance class two, week, two days a week. I, you know, I'm sure that there's some science class that you can take two days a week. But I'm not, I'm not aware of those as being as commonplace as piano lessons, 
as, uh, let's take paint classes. Um, so the engagement and the expression that kids typically come to, to develop around music or writing or sharing things on Facebook or Instagram or, um, what was I thinking? So music, you know, any, any form of expression that typically brands around an artistic medium, there's a lot of that on the outside in this sort of sea of opportunity. And so it was interesting to us to think about how could you bring those kinds of expressions, how could these things start to meet so that some of the sort of scientific stuff that's going on in schools might meet the expressive stuff in ways that, again, um, if we thought about it as being steamy, would that, in fact, sort of allow them to sort of have these forms of expressions that, in fact, involve some deeper understanding of STEM concepts. Right. And, and again, so part of our thinking was that that integration, if you could think about, again, how you might take these things that are very sciencey in the school, and then how might those start to kind of come together more with the artistic expression. Uh, this was sort of big for us because we did realize at some point, it's important to think that at some point, arts and science weren't very separated disciplines. That uh, if we go back to, certainly, to the greatest of all time, Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, I just said that. Leonardo da Vinci, goat. Greatest of all time. Um, sculptor, painter, there wasn't anything that Leonardo couldn't do. And a lot of that was, by thinking about this, by having a very sort of, um, uh, no separation between sort of doing artistic practice and what might be considered scientific practice. So obviously a lot of inventions. Uh, and you know, uh, again, great painter. And once you, certainly once you do this, I mean, again, now you can be called the greatest of all time. Um, another example that I came to appreciate while at Rhode Island School of Design was, um, this is a painting by Samuel Morris called the Gallery, uh, Gallery of the Louvre. And the deal with this is sort of, um, Samuel Morris saw a gallery in the Louvre, and he didn't like the way that the art was hung. He thought he could sort of curate the thing better. So to do that, there's two ways to do that. One way is to say, I think you could just make that better. I would move that here and I would move that there. Samuel Morris said, I'm going to paint the Louvre the way I think it should look, replicating all of the paintings that all these other people did, sort of making me almost the greatest of all time, because <laughs> I just showed all of you people up and show the Louvre designers that this is the way that you're actually supposed to do creation, yeah, to curate a, an exhibit. So it's a, a pretty amazing painting. And um, I've, I've always been sort of impressed by it because of that. I thought like, wow, that sort of takes some, uh, it takes a lot of work to really think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually show you how to do this right by replicating <laughs> a gallery of the Louvre in my own painting. Um, one of my colleagues at RISD said at some point, he said, you know, art school is for contrarians. And, and it started, this always struck me as one of those examples of like, yeah, the contrarian who comes and says, like, I can make that better than you. By the way, when he said that, I was like, oh, no wonder I'm in art school. So I, 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 it, that was part of also explaining why I belonged in such a place. Not only did Morris do this painting and actually show people what the Louvre should look like, he was kind of like, you know what, and then on top of that, I'm going to invent a certain code and a certain telegraph, and then that way I can tell all my friends how wrong you were about the way that you curated this. So the painter Samuel Morris is the Morris Code Samuel Morris um, that revolutionized telecommunication. So if you think about that, that kind of creativity, to be able to think sort of at an aesthetic sensibility and also to bring that aesthetics to the instruments that he was designing. A lot of scientific instruments, uh, were, when they were designed, they were, there was a sense of aesthetic sensibility that those designers said as scientists and artists, because we don't know the difference, um, they were beautiful instruments. And so there's really great um, uh, collections of scientific instruments that are very beautiful and, and because of this sort of aesthetic sensibility that went along with it. Um, and so that sort of aesthetics plus the scientific stuff, that is the stuff that leads to innovation. And so one of the really key points about the STEAM movement, and I think one of the things that has allowed it to take off uh, and to sort of gain traction in the way it did, and I'll talk a little bit about what some of that traction is, is appealing to innovation. So you have to remember that, um, well, before I say that, um, now I can say that the father in, for many people of STEAM is John Maida, who was the president of, of Rhode Island School of Design uh, during the time that I was there. Um, and so John was going on the circuit and sort of talking to people and pointing out uh, sort of his beliefs about the world that were 
that artists and designers would be the innovators of the century uh, and that they're problem solving the ways that they ex uh, explored not only critical thinking but critical making and that was a very big thing at RISD. We would always talk about there is critical thinking obviously and we talk about that a lot and we want to engage students in that. Um, but this idea of critical making to say we want to be able to construct things but have people really sort of reflect on what is it that they're building and why is it that they're building. Uh, and then he would say, and these are the things that make the, that, that'll make the country competitive. Um, and so that was a, a very big, um, they're sort of big words, and in some sense there's no reason for anyone to believe that art and design is going to change the nation and make it competitive. Uh, except that at the time that we were, were doing this work, and I think timing is everything, um, we were in a period where, um, let's say if you remember 2008, that was the year that Earth went broke. Okay, so you, you can see there, that's the graph of the New York Stock Exchange uh, over there. Uh, and it kind of goes down and down and down, and then the Earth goes broke. Right? So this was the global economic crisis. Um, and it resulted in everyone trying to figure out how do we get ourselves out of it. Now that we are in a recession, a, a recession the size that we've never seen before, that, that's you know, unprecedented since the Great Depression, how do we get ourselves out of this? How do we make the country competitive again? Um, how do we start thinking about generating economic strength? And um, so to start to think that maybe it's something about art and design wasn't so far-fetched because it was clear it wasn't the Lehman Brothers that were going to pull us out of this because of what happened. So something else had to happen. And I think that, honestly, that I, I really think that a, a big reason that the Steve movement took off was because people were in search of how do we get ourselves out of this? There's got to be another way to make some kind of industry that will again generate uh, economic strength. And in terms of economic strength, it meant generating jobs. So I, certainly when I was in Rhode Island, a big call in the state was, was simply to politicians, we need jobs. And to have those jobs, you have to have some kind of industry. Um, and Rhode Island came from great manufacturing routes. And so it was sort of kind of making sense to the political powers there that there may be some way of rethinking manufacturing alongside of technology plus art and design. Um, oh yeah, speaking of jobs, if this moves, speaking of jobs, and again, I'm not an Apple fanboy, so stop that. Um, speaking of jobs, at the same time that Earth went broke, Apple was going gangbusters in terms of their profits. And one of the big questions about that, of course, was so where, how did this company that almost went bankrupt at one point in time, suddenly rise to become the richest company uh, in the world. And, and there's many reasons one could sort of think about that, but, but Steve Jobs and Apple became kind of a, a sort of signpost for STEAM for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's obvious that design was put to the forefront in, in terms of Apple's products from the very beginning. There was always an aesthetic uh, sensibility that Apple had that other companies didn't. And one can attribute the, the, sort of come, the, the sort of rise of the phoenix uh, with the iMac um, a lot to design and to having a very clear sense of, yeah, here's a cool machine and it's got some megahertz and everything like that, but we're not going to talk about that. It's Bondi Blue. Okay, that's what you want to think about. You actually want to think about the way that this thing looks and how it feels and how it sort of changes the experience of dealing with computation. Um, the other part was that Jobs was very explicit. He said Apple is a company that's at the intersection of technology and the liberal arts. And by saying that, what he meant was, of course, yes, we do build great hardware, we, great, we build a great oper operating system, but the real thing is the human aspect of it. And so the rhetoric, that the way that he always talked about the machinery was never in terms of like, you're going to love this thing, it's got like a quad core, triple hydromatic, you know, it wasn't like a you know, <laughs> systematic. It was very much in terms of this is the way that um, it's the computer for the rest of us. Um, we think different, those of us who use this. And very much a kind of humanistic um, sort of way that the Apple has approached things. So again, this became something where you could say to politicians, uh, you know why you want to care about art and design and the intersection of technology? You want to do it because you want to look at Apple's stock. And, and so that made a lot of sense and it was, it was able to give us um, some political energy. Um, and in particular, um, Rhode Island is a great state because it's, uh, for many reasons, but one reason it's a great state is because it's tiny. And be, being tiny, you get to know everybody, including your congressional representatives and your Senate representatives. So 
This was a resolution, um, it's one of a series of resolutions that was written by um, Representative Jim Landsman, who is um, of, of Rhode Island. And this went to the House, uh, this is House Resolution 51, expressing the sense of the House of Representatives that adding art and design into federal programs that target STEM fields encourages innovation and economic growth in the United States. So um, because of this sort of hope that, well, perhaps STEAM will actually, the innovation that we might be able to see from people who sort of cross into these intersections started to give some political leverage. And a lot of that was, again, due to relationships that we had with um, our representatives uh, at the federal level in the state of Rhode Island and also to our government relations person, uh, Babette Alina, who did a lot of the groundwork in terms of trying to, to, to make sure that when we do STEAM, we should start to think as a grassroots movement where we want to change the way that we think about education, we should also be thinking top down and start to try and influence policy at the same time. And so some of that work then led to what is now a Congressional STEAM Caucus that is active. It's been active for a couple of years now. Um, it's led by Suzanne Bonamici of, of Oregon, Democrat Oregon, uh, and Aaron Schock, Republican Illinois. Um, and I think there's probably, uh, there's at least the last I checked, there were around some 50 some members of this caucus, and they've been working with different people who are representatives of the STEAM community to try to understand what does this mean? How can industry help in some of this? And ultimately, what policies might need to be generated to make some kinds of changes in education so that this or almost any other kinds of movements that say, we are really trying to work hard to change STEM education. How can we get you know, the federal power to start to listen to us and to, to take us seriously about this? Um, so that's the caucus. Uh, the National Science Foundation also, just briefly, was also a, um, a big part of sort of pushing the STEAM movement forward. I mentioned that they had funded a workshop um, on STEM to STEAM uh, at Rhode Island School of Design. Um, that brought, again, a, a lot of people together. This is the Nature Lab at, at RISD. Um, so we were able to do, uh, instead of having a workshop with a lot of talk, we, were, we really did hands-on with these people who are decision makers to try to see, to help them see what are the, what are the ways that we can start to talk about that. And the only way to talk about that in art school is you, gotta, you actually have to do it. So the Nature Lab was a place with lots of uh, hmm, uh, taxidermy animals, like lots of, uh, and it was all there. You, you could go and you could sort of say, like, can I check out a squirrel today? Because you needed to touch it, draw it, and feel it to really sort of understand sort of how to model that. Um, so there are skeletons and all kinds of things. So this was a great, great place to do um, um, some work around, uh, this was about taxonomy, classify different collections of animals. And part of what we were trying to do was to say, yeah, normally a biologist would say, well, I understand genus, species, things like that. But there's the accepted scientific de definition. But from an arts perspective, you might think about that in totally different ways. Like, these are the things that are um, soft. These are the things that are kind of scratchy. So there are lots of different generations, of people generating different classification schemes, uh, and sort of dealing with the ambiguity that comes with that. Um, also, uh, RISD has a, a, a very large collection of, of art and a museum of art. And so here, much as I said observation earlier, uh, here was where we could do things with people around observation and interpretation of artwork. So again, that kind of thinking around um, what are fundamental scientific skills and how can you approach them not only from a science angle but also from an artistic angle. And then to have conversations about what are the things that are different about these, these disciplines and yet sometimes very similar about the disciplines. So uh, very quickly, because I see we're coming up on, on time, although I think I get another 40 minutes for the beginning, um, <laughs> is an issue of identity that came out of this, the STEM Justine workshop and has been a very, uh, it's a prominent issue in a lot of the work that, that many researchers uh, are doing now thinking about STEM um, or any kinds of educational work. And that is, um, I guess the best way to sort of say this is, there's a test in the informal science world um, called the draw a scientist test. And it's that, you ask people to draw a scientist. That's why they call it. And uh, <laughs> so typically you get images that in fact look like like that. This is um, a mountain and not a scientist. We're back live. And so that you would get some images like this. That was obviously payback for my AV crack, just to say anything. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, Penn State. Um, you get the guy with the what you get the guy for sure in the in the lab coat 
the chemicals, the crazy equations, and things like this. And you can imagine going to a kid, asking them to draw a scientist, and they would draw some image like this. Then you could say, so do you want to be a scientist when you grow up? And I don't really know that many kids would think, yeah, that would be cool to be that person. Um, on the other hand, if Will I Am says, you know what I like, what I, what I think is important is that, that iPod, that iPhone, that thing that you listen to music with, you ought to know that that's engineered in particular ways, that engineers and scientists make those things, and you ought to know how it works. And I can show you sort of ways that you can learn how to do that. You're going to get a lot more buy-in. Um, and so uh, Will I Am uh, has uh, the I Am Angel Foundation. There's more and more people, I think, that are coming around and sort of trying to take an interest in STEM and really trying to understand, well, how can we sort of put role models, people from popular culture who believe that this stuff is, is important, and making those people the role models so that at some point, uh, Will I Am actually has his, he's got a watch, his, his uh, new fancy watch that's sort of going to compete with, say, an Apple watch or something like that is, is due to be released soon. I don't think it's come out yet. But he actually now sees himself as like, okay, I'm actually, I'm into this so much that I'm going to be the inventor so that I can say to the kids that he works with in Los Angeles, you know, you in fact can be that too. Um, so he's doing a lot of work around STEAM. He's doing a lot of work uh, uh, with robotics. Um, this is the point where I was going to, there was a, I can just kind of show you the, the piece of video. So a couple years ago, I, uh, I guess it was last year, uh, I gave, wow, this is, everything's dead. Uh, I was at the U.S. Science and Engineering Festival, we we'll kind of wrap it back up, <laughs> and um, this was a piece of video that one of the people of, of the panel, we were on a STEAM panel, and I was with, and the sound's not cooperating, but Lily Cam, who works for uh, Will I Am, and also uh, studied at MIT Media Lab, um, showed this piece of video in this big crowd with the convention center in Washington, D.C., on a big screen. And as soon as it started to play, I mean, people started running over because, of course, they recognized, and, and it has sound. And so what they're saying, and it is mostly, um, it is things about, hey, you know what, science is important. Look, I mean, they had Snoop Dogg. So once you got Snoop Dogg, I mean, it's like for shizzle. You know, it's on from there. And so a lot of people were coming, really, because of the, the celebrity power. And if you could hear this, I mean, oh, you should hear it. It's great. <laughs> Um, you can go look it up on the website. But the important part was that things like that, like the I Am First Foundation, uh, we were also surprised to see in uh, Sesame Street, their season 43 was dedicated to STEAM. It was, we, Sesame Street is brought to you by the letters S-T-E-A-M. So to get that kind of right, and it was highlighting how artists use STEM knowledge uh, to enhance their art and solve problems. Um, so again, so thinking about the identity kinds of things here, I mean, this is, uh, the, the appeal of Sesame Street is so big that either kids or their parents, um, who often cope you the show with their children, uh, it was a, a way to expose them also to sort of thinking about what is the importance of STEM, how can we get that out to people, and in fact, it's not this draw a scientist thing, uh, it's really, you know, if Grover does it, it sort of must be cool. So uh, again, a lot of people are sort of looking at that, and one reason to try to think about this in an artistic perspective uh, is um, there's a study that was done by James Catterall, who's a uh, professor emeritus at UCLA, and um, it was a um, it was a report that they did for the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, long longitudinal studies that looked at at-risk kids and the kids who were uh, somehow engaged in arts program, whether that was in school or out of school. Uh, certainly showed much more um, uh, higher achievement, better achievement in school, longer uh, sort of they would stay in school as opposed to dropping out. There was something about having a connection to these arts and doing artistic programs. And it's probably not, oh, if you paint, you are more likely to stay in school. But in fact, the practices that go along with, um, if you think about being an artist or a musician, there's a lot of practice. There's a lot of 
involvement by parents. Once parents start to get involved in those programs, it's likely that they will get involved in other programs like science or math. And so there's something about that sort of artistic connection that's very important. And I think it's not necessarily, oh, everyone needs to sketch so much as really some of the practices or the habits of mind that go along with the arts are really sort of the key things that we would like to sort of shift and make sure that they're included in more science kinds of programming that don't already have them. Um, how, how much time can I get? Okay. Uh, so very quickly, um, yes, why art and design? That was sort of where I was going to go. Um, and I mentioned that I think a lot of it is this sort of issue of, of habits of mind. Um, and really what happens in, to some extent, um, when I was at RISD, a lot of what I did was I, I basically spied. That was sort of my, my thing. I will go and spy on studio courses to sort of think about, well, how do they work? What goes on in those courses? And what, how are they different um, from something that we might see in, in STEM classrooms? Now, it turns out I didn't need to do that because other people have done it uh, much more rigorously. Uh, and so, for instance, some of that work, uh, this is... Uh, so some of the work, Lois Hetland, uh, Ellen Winter, uh, Project Zero is a, is a well-known arts education project at Harvard University. Um, and the work that they did was they looked at studio classes. And they went into the art studio and said, what's going on? Um, other people have done similar kinds of work. Um, uh, Robert Ruth Bernstein is another researcher who has done a lot of work looking at sort of what goes on in terms of how do people, what are the kind of skills that artists bring to things? How do they, in what ways are they similar to things that scientists do? So how are those things shared? And then looking in classrooms and saying, interestingly, in arts classrooms, these things are present. And a lot of science classes, they're not necessarily present. So studio habits of mind. Um, uh, another um, take on this, uh, Jessica Hoffman Davis is also a Harvard researcher in arts education, uh, who's written several books now on sort of why schools need the arts and the importance of thinking about arts um, and sort of trying to make sure that they're included in, in sort, of, sort of school curriculum. And so just very quickly, um, you can think about, so if you think about things that happen in, in art studios or art classrooms, right, there's always a notion of building a tangible product, whether that be a painting, a sculpture, a piece of music, um, a dance, always a tangible product. And you could say, well, there's always a tangible product in almost anything, right, that a quiz or a final exam or a problem set in engineering is also a tangible product. And the distinction she says uh, that she makes is, uh, in the art classroom, the tangible products are typically generated by the learner, right? So there's a sense of it being, uh, there's imagination and a sense of agency of this thing belongs to me. So again, if you go into a painting studio and you say, I want you to experiment with sort of figure ground today. Here are the basic parameters. Here's some constraints, because creativity needs constraint. Go for it. You're typically not going to see the same outcome versus, again, it, some kind of course where you would say, uh, if it's an engineering course, and you say, obviously you say build a bridge, you'll get different variants of that. But there's much greater variation, and a lot of that is, to, is because there's a great sense of sort of, you must use the imagination, and again, having agency for that. Um, emotion is clearly very, uh, highly tied to the arts. It's what we usually think about when we think, what are the arts about? It's a way that we express emotion and meaning. Um, and, and there's that term, expression. So in order to sort of create a meaningful piece of, of artwork, you have to be able to sort of understand, think about it, how do I, in fact, generate these particular emotions? And then also, how do I empathize with others to understand, how can I communicate this particular emotion to other people? How will they understand, the, the, to sort of get the interpretation that I'd like them to get? Um, which is, um, I think, actually, it sort of relates much more to science communication in some sense, is how do we convey the ideas or the, I, in fact, even our own field, of, uh, uh, for many of us who are in education, how do we convey the importance of this stuff to the public in, in some ways can sort of benefit from thinking about how do artists communicate? Um, so I said ambiguity a little bit with, um, if you're thinking about how to express that, there's always ambiguous meaning, not only in the arts, but certainly in the sciences. Unfortunately, people sometimes think that science and education is all about effect. It's about sort of getting the right answer. Uh, and we've done a lot, a lot of work uh, in my area, the, the learning sciences that many of you are, are in, and thinking about how do you actually get students to not see this as just fact, but actually understand that there are multiple ways, multiple hypotheses, and how do you get them to deal with that? Um, so it's the same kind of situation uh, in the art classroom where you see how do you get people to sort of think about multiple interpretations, and then to have respect for other interpretations, 
And that respect may be to understand that, hey, you actually may, we're clearly not agreeing on these, these sort of interpretations or hypotheses, but maybe somewhere in the middle there actually is some interesting thing that we can explore. Um, interestingly, in the art studio, although we tend to think of the arts as the product, it's the here is the painting, here is the piece of music, there's a very a strong orientation towards process. And, and this is also a very, a very clear call in most of the science work, certainly I think in the next generation of science standards, where people are saying, you know, it's very important to think about not just how do you learn facts and skills, but how do you think about getting kids to think about what does it mean to be and to engage in the practice and the processes of being a scientist. Um, and so these are very common words in, in the education field. I think about inquiry, reflection, and how do we get students to engage in that stuff. Again, it's something I think we're seeing much more of in STEM and, and in schools and, and the kind of work that um, interventions that are being designed. Um, but it's clearly a very, very key process in the art world. And finally, this issue of connection. So um, I think that anybody who, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, some of you may be science uh, technology engineering people, but I think when most people go into those fields, they actually do it because they, they want to change the world. So I was an engineering student, I was computer, well actually it was mechanical engineering first and then I couldn't deal with that. And I moved to computer electrical engineering and because um, I thought I could do computer music. Yeah, it was steamy. Um, and I, it was a clear, I want to change the world. And then you, you get to, we t I've talked a lot about K-12. Then you get to undergraduate and edu uh, engineering education and that pretty much ends that, certainly as a mechanical engineer. Now I'm getting some head shaking, so there we go. Because they, what they do is they say, before you can touch engineering, you have to learn <coughs> physics, you have to learn. Uh, so it's a lot of theory before you can actually start to sort of do the synthesis that you really want to do as an engineer. Um, and I think artists also want to be artists because they want to change the world. And, and then at RISD, I was really sort of, I was very impressed by the, the sort of like the, the way that students expressed this, that the culture was set up to sort of help people understand that the arts can in fact make an impact in the world. Right? And it was very explicit, right? And it was the, the students were all very um, very keen on sort of how can we be civically engaged, socially engaged, and how can we speak to that with our arts and also to have a sort of sense of responsibility, that it is our responsibility as artists in fact, to sometimes do things that provoke, to make people think, uh, again, in ways that change the world. And I, I think that, again, like for, for, as I say, I think most people who go into STEM disciplines are thinking, yeah, I really want to change the world. And what we need to do is to sort of figure out a way to make sure that people still can hold that, right? And so when people are going through STEM courses and suddenly they drop out, a lot of times it's the, I don't think I can change the world this way. I need to go up somewhere else and figure out how to do it. Um, and so it's, it's interesting, sometimes I found being at, at RISD, um, that sort of the language, that sometimes it was discourse or, or, or language or ways of communication that drove people to do a particular thing. Uh, example I had is, uh, was a student I worked with there who said, I, I thought about majoring in mechanical engineering <coughs> when I was, you know, I did well in math and I really liked it. But I was a little turned off by math. It was just, there's something about it that um, just wasn't working for me. So I came to RISD and now I'm an industrial designer. And if you think about what industrial designers do, they design products and they do a lot of what mechanical engineers actually do. And somehow the language, the, the translation, because you could look at the work that they did and go, clearly you're doing mechanical engineering. You just don't think that you're doing mechanical engineering because of the way that we've talked about this at RISD. So a lot of times it just seemed to me that, that in fact, some of the art science kind of issues were really sort of more linguistic, that they were, you know, if there was a shared vocabulary, a way that they could talk about their practices and see the, the similarities, um, that people might start to see this very differently. Um, so given the time, uh, and Bart, and given that Bart has stood up with a microphone, this is actually a good place to stop. Um, so with that, I, let's take questions, if you have questions, I mean, I think the Really, the last point that I was going to make was um, was really to sort of to sort of wrap all of this up and to say that um, steam as art and design, as opposed to steam as agriculture or or steam by putting medicine on it. Um, yeah, I think the reason that we've been looking at this, and I think that some of the reasons that this is propelled, is because there's really sort of a case for what are the art and design practices, what kinds of innovation and creativity go on there, 
And how do you complement sort of the creativity and innovation that go on in any scientific or mathematical or those fields? Um, and to sort of start to understand how you can break some of those barriers down and to start to move towards, you know, these things over here in the arts are not so much different than these things in the sciences. Um, hopefully in terms of, and, and hopefully sort of engage uh, greater innovation and then also a sense of identity that will push more people into uh, pursuing these careers in the long term. Mark Purcell, turn it to you. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Brian. I'll bring the mic around for anyone that has questions. So when you talked about art in this talk, you used what I would call a formal conception of art. So you mentioned things like painting and music and dance. But at no point did you equate art and crafting, which is where, for me in my research, I'm interested in seeing the interconnection between STEM and the A in STEAM. Right. And so I'm curious about how you would connect things in, in your context, um, like STEAM with knitting and sewing and crochet, sure. because those are places where you're using the fruits of STEM research. You're engaging in um, engineering concepts while doing your process. Right. Absolutely. Um, well, as um, in the in an art school, one of the things I learned very quickly was you do not talk about art and craft in the same. <clears throat> I watched someone do that. It was uh, it was a beatdown. And um, so, in fact, I think a lot of when we thought about STEAM at RISD, we were certainly talking much more probably sort of the capital A art and capital D design. Having said that, the importance of craft, and I think that a lot of where this action is happening is really in again those informal spaces that I mentioned. Um, so if I think about it, so let's talk about the maker movement, right? Uh, the maker movement, for those of you who don't know it, uh, it's a sort of do-it-yourself. Uh, gosh, it's, it sort of exploded in the same way, kind of parallel with STEAM, with people saying, you know, we can do interesting things, some of them crafting. Um, in fact, you know, actually in my unit, in my continuing ed unit, we had um, one of our most successful sets of courses was around knitting. So certainly I should say that. And I learned a lot about knitting because I had no idea how big knitting was until these students came and were saying, like, no, you don't understand. Like, we go to like the Vogue knitting conference. And the, so it's, um, so those things, I mean, are obviously also plays. The, the knitting, um, you know, if you bring arts down to the to sort of uh, people who are saying, like, look, I just want to make, um, Greeting cards, I want to make iMovies. Sometimes people, I mean, sometimes in a continuing ed unit, we would also, uh, uh, so often we would be, um, well, you know, your guys don't have the rigor <laughs> that the degree people have because this was the professional artist. And um, I, so I found that the craft side, and that was another appeal of continuing ed, was very important. In particular, the ways that I think people are sort of coming to engage with technological objects at the same time. Uh, you know, it was a, a number of years ago when I first saw people doing things with electronics and textiles. And I wouldn't have guessed that that would have become as big as it is now. <clears throat> and part of that is because the systems, the, the computer systems, the, the different ways that the kits that you can do to buy to actually do this allow people to do it. But the fact that obviously is that there's a huge community of crafters out there who want to play with these kinds of toys, uh, tools and to say, how can we actually enhance craft and push it to new, new stages. So, uh, so I apologize for not <laughs> mentioning it because I think it's extremely important. And I think really, again, a lot of the, the real action, I think, is that's happening, not only in informal spaces, but schools that I've talked to that uh, and gone to that have, are building maker spaces now in, you know, on their campuses because they recognize the need to say, like, sometimes we'll just have people come over here and make. And the making doesn't necessarily have to be computerized. It may actually be Things like let's get kids making signage or, or whatever just happens to be that um, again is part of the expressive. I think we might have an online question. So we have an online question asking: Do you see college major names changing terminology, or do you see disciplines crossing over with course selection sequence or almost a dual major? <laughs> do I see um, let's say high school so college major names right? Do I see universities changing? Um, no, never. Um, <laughs> I don't see them changing. I think they're very, uh, well, anyway, I shouldn't go on that. But um, do I see them changing? 
Not necessarily. I, I guess what I would say is that I, I do think that on the other hand, there are programs that have started to turn up, that, uh, to emerge that are things around art science. Um, I think what would happen more is that there will be programs that suddenly appear. Uh, and that those, the appearance of those programs would be in specialized areas. So for instance, um, I know Santa Cruz just came out with a program that was, someone help me with this. It's a media gaming hybrid that's sort of thinking about sort of arts humanities around digital media. All right. And so those programs will sprout up. I think it would be not necessarily majors would change, but that new things would, would sprout up. So people might say, now we're going to have a new media arts and sciences major. People might do that, that kind of work. So at one point, some of my colleagues uh, that I've been working with started to look about, started to think about what are places that have appeared that look like something like the MIT Media Laboratory or the <coughs> Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon or places that are these uh, New York, uh, NYU has um, ITP, Interactive Technology, P, <laughs> CITP. Uh, and so which of those places like sort of emerged and how many of those places have disappeared? And, and actually the, the group that I've been looking, working with on this has, has tried to figure out at what point did they sort of die? Was it die? Did they die because there weren't students? Did they die because of administrative pressures? Um, yes, so I, I think that there's going to be things, and I think actually in the question of the dual major, one of the most popular majors at Rhode Island School of Design was a, is it was a dual program with Brown. And so there were lots of students trying to get in that because they said, what I'd like to do is I'd like to pursue a great arts education, but I'd actually like to do science and the sciences that you could get at Brown or humanities at Brown or whatever it happened to be. So I think in particular, I think that there's going to be more of, uh, yeah, that's good. Um, <laughs> I think there will be more um, students doing that seeking interdisciplinary opportunities that will force universities to create new programs, I hope. I guess I'm next. Uh, so thanks to our esteemed colleague for coming back and uh, helping us with this. Um, I'd like to sort of tie into that last question and your comments earlier about uh, constructionism as a learning theory and uh, relate to, so Stanford had this uh, sort of think tank exercise called Stanford 2015. And one of the things they came up with, one of the ideas of five that they sort of group circled around, was this idea of a, <clears throat> instead of a major, you'll have a mission, right? And I could see that sort of bringing things together. So like maybe your mission is to eradicate poverty in Cleveland or something. Right? And I think artists are kind of on this long-term mission. And I, I think that there's, I agree with you, there's maybe less hope that universities will change in that direction than that new universities might emerge that go in that direction. But can you say a little bit more about connectionism and, and maybe this idea, I mean constructionism, uh, and this idea of, of uh, sort of purpose and, you know, just maybe a little more about learning around. Sure. I mean, so the Stanford mission piece is a great example of that in terms of sort of, I think, in putting forward sort of uh, how do you sort of get people to sort of think about what are things that are meaningful to them. So if it's the, I want to, um, eradicate poverty, you know, how do you actually give them opportunities to do that? Um, you know, as a one model, so the, the Excite Center that I mentioned earlier um, is, is actually, it's, it's sort of an interesting experiment within Drexel in that we don't sit in any department and it's really just a space. And the, the idea of the space is that people come here to, you have to come here to collaborate. If you want to have a project, you have to collaborate with other disciplines. And, and you don't get permanent space, so don't try that. <laughs> and really the idea was to sort of say, uh, so some of, the, some of the projects that go on there are some people who are interested in, how can we work with, say, West Philadelphia schools um, and get them to sort of, um, there's a project called the Digital On-Ramp. So how do we sort of get people on board, get them technologically there to help them um, start to actually do things with technology um, that are beyond just, here's sort of, you know, office computing skills and things like that, but actually moving into things that might be, that help them say, uh, answer questions about how can I think about my community. All right, so by creating this sort of open space and open it also to the community, what I think we're trying to do is to say, let's break down the whole disciplinary thing and really have the Excite Center be a place where people come to, again, construct things, right? Whatever those constructions happen to be. Um, and I guess it's this idea, I, I mean, I think the, 
the idea of sort of bringing people, so we have a lot of people who come in from the engineering side of Drexel, of course, because that's typically what we see is a lot of science and engineering students. That's the, the sort of what we're known for. Um, and, and so again, the Excite Center is a place where we can start these discussions. And we have talk series and things like that. Um, where people come in and they're really, I guess, it's sort of how can we help students see that these options are so open and that a lot of what they will be doing in their classrooms, the sort of the skills that they gain there are actually very useful in sort of constructing ideas that can actually make an impact. So it's, it's really trying to sort of bring them and make sure that they have, besides their sort of usual courses, giving them other opportunities where they can come and say, oh, I see. So there are these people who are out there and, you know, it's, a, you know, we do hackathons, we do sort of the code for change kinds of events. Um, so again, giving people opportunities to say, like, here's how you can apply what you're doing in the classroom in these sort of more uh, humanistic ways if that's what they choose to do. Um, did that answer? Yeah, I, I, asked, I asked a nebulous question. You do a good okay, job. I did a nebulous answer. Yeah, so that's good. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we, we have a specific question from uh, the online audience. Karen says, when I moved from a focus on math ed to art ed, strictly in order to pursue STEAM as a research interest, I was surprised by the pushback from artists and art professors against the STEAM movement. Have you encountered this from the art side? Fuck Karen, hate is going to hate. Um, <laughs> that's kind of how it is. Yes, I've seen it from both sides, art side. And science side, and for a while we were very cautious actually to use, about using the term STEAM, certainly with federal uh, federal organizations. So, so a lot of our conversations with colleagues in, at the National Science Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, and National Endowment for the Humanities were really, um, well, we're trying to do something that's art science integrated, and people would say STEAM. I think that's... Um, so here's my take on it. What I think happened was that because the STEAM thing took off in a way, and um, this, you know, it was marketing, right? To get it out there, there had to be a lot of heavy duty marketing. And, you know, and I think what happened was on one side, arts educators felt, you know, we're trying to sort of do a, a lot of our, you know, we've been, what's wrong with art? So there's one, one side of the story that goes like this. What's wrong with art education? Why do you have to put the STEM into it? There's another side that says, on the science side, people would say, we have enough problems trying to do science education. How are we going to get the arts into it? And I think those are both fair arguments. And so we've tried to sort of, I certainly try to be very careful about how, how talk, you know, talking about this with people or different organizations. So um, we've been talking, uh, in general, uh, with people like American Association for, uh, for the Advancement of Science, uh, Americans for the Arts, and trying to sort of bring National Science Teachers Association, they're bringing those groups together to sort of have them actually help us think about how to talk about this in ways that make sense. Um, and so that you don't actually get people um, upset about this. But certainly we've heard from people that said, um, you know, we, we're trying to do STEM. Art has no place in that. And we've heard from arts people who've said, you know, in some cases, it's, it's, we have limited resources in the arts anyway. Now you want to sort of give those resources to something called STEAM. So I think that those things will continue <laughs> because it's sort of human nature to try and protect disciplinary boundaries or territories. And, um, but at the same time, I think it's sort of like the, the university point that we brought up earlier. It's, it's some of this stuff will, will start to happen. And um, hopefully they'll be able to coexist. But yeah, the answer really is that. Yes, I, I've seen that from the art side and the science side. Um, my question, oh, my question uh, touches indirectly on a few of the elements of the previous one. And, but it also has to do with the question of where a certain other letter might fit in. And that's H, not this time for humanities, but for history. Um, because I was thinking how telling the examples that you bring from uh, Leonardo da Vinci and, and, and Morse um, and the effect that history has in uh, enabling us to see what can sometimes feel like insuperable necessities as being just historical contingencies and how certain features of the way artists, artists self-identify and the way uh, scientists self-identify is a relatively recent invention, um, which, like so many other, uh, can change in, in many important and instructive ways. And as someone who 
relates to a lot of these through my own background in history and philosophy of science and technology and recognizing that the scientists have a challenge you know articulating their their practices in ways that that completely separate them from the artists and the artists have the same challenges if they're gonna that that seeing that and 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 seeing that there are certain certain contingent historical approaches to these disciplines that 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 sort of bring about and and entrench certain divides that are that are by no means necessary and seeing how they can also be counterproductive on both sides is sort of helpful for thinking about the the integration of the other other letters that are in steam yeah no in fact so one part of that is is it is it RISD there was a strong liberal arts group so there were liberal arts faculty there and it was a you know part of that was in you almost wouldn't expect it and it's in a place like that obviously because it's so uh, production is so maker oriented, but the liberal arts group was there really to provide those kind of contexts. So <clears throat> it was when when people when we would talk about the RISD undergraduate experience, a lot of it was these are makers who are very grounded in the liberal arts <clears throat> and the humanities, and it is those things that drive them. It's it's those things that help them gain this connection to civic responsibility, to social engagement. Um, and so it was a very important part of the film. The work at RISD. Um, the other part I can say is that in talking with STEAM, so we've done a lot of sort of canvassing with funding groups. Again, National Science Foundation is, is, is an obvious one. National Endowment for the Arts is an, an obvious one. Um, but the National Endowment for the Humanities has also been part of many of these discussions. And so even though I say art and design, uh, more recently the humanities has been pulled in essentially as that, as well here is the humanistic core. Two of these are the disciplines that essentially build and sort of build out on those things. And so um, there's actually some interesting, uh, the three of those, those organizations are really looking together and they have, I mean, they're understaffed like every organization, unfortunately, but they are trying to sort of figure out ways that there might be, is where are those intersections? And how might we even start to find programs that look at research that are humanities, arts, scientific and and what what could that lead to so so that's that's a great question and um I, and I, it really is because it's it's uh it's it's the stuff that's happening right now i think that there's a lot of interest in that uh and groups that i'm also that i'm still working with. thank you um, my question is actually how do you find the people who have a similar mind to collaborate uh, between different disciplines because like you mentioned some people are very uh, resistant so how, how can we create a climate to find actually these people who are really uh, willing to collaborate? How do you do it? You know it's, it's um, I don't know how to do it and, and even worse I think is when you can do it and you can bring people together, then there's the how do you keep them remain t together, right? So that how do you sort of hold those collaborations? So I think it's very difficult. I think the sort of history of any sort of highly interdisciplinary research lab um, has all, have always been sort of fraught with this, how do you get people to play along and sort of make those disciplinary boundaries? And so um, I, I would, I guess that, you know, interestingly, when, when a lot of the STEAM work started, there was a, a joint workshop that was funded by the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. And that first workshop that later set the stage for the STEAM workshop brought together what I would say are the usual suspects. And so there's a collection of people in the world who sort of would say, I ident self-identify as like an artist scientist. And somehow they found them all <laughs> and brought them into this first workshop. Um, and it wasn't that they were necessarily collaborating, but it was, it was things like that, by having sort of a convening like that, that led to another workshop, another workshop, another workshop. A lot of the steam kind of stuff going on and, and networks of those people starting to building outside their, outside their institution. So I think there is, um, there's definitely conscious efforts, uh, again, that have been taking place through some NSF funding to build networks so that people like this can collaborate. 
Uh, and then the second place was to have, again, uh, the Excite Center was built because we said, how can we create this place where we say there's no disciplinary turf, there's no departmental, there's no, um, <coughs> we don't have a budget, so we ain't got no money. Um, and so you just have to come and work with other people. And, and what I would say is that successful. I would say uh, it's a little successful. So th there's a core group of us that participate in that space. How to expand it? Uh, and, I, and, I, and again, for some reasons, sometimes it's people would like to do it, but they have other obligations. They have other research agendas that are going on. Um, so it's hard, but I think that there are certainly, one, I, I think that a big thing that has been helpful that I've seen is these ideas of just saying, you sort of have to open it up to people and say, here is a space where you can come and understand what would be the benefits of working across disciplines. So that's another one is, you know, is there any benefit to certain people uh, if they do that? Um, and so, um, you know, some of it is showing the sort of, here are these collaborations and what are the, how do, they, how do these interdisciplinary collaborations pay off in some way to get you whatever that is you need, grant money, course releases to do more of that. Um, so yeah, but it, I think it's very hard and I think it's hard to sustain any of that. I wish I knew the answer. If I knew the answer, yeah. But. All right, let's thank everyone one more time. Thank you. Thank you.